So what are we going to talk about? Um, generally speaking, we're going to talk about a uh, certain type of supply chain attacks. What are supply chain attacks? Supply chain attacks are these kind of attacks that target the um, process of uh, manufacturing any kind of software or any kind of uh, updating systems for these softwares. Uh, examples, two popular examples here would be first the shadow hammer attack, which was an attack uh, that um, introduced a lot of malicious code uh, via uh, distributed via an updating uh, server that was owned by ASUS and compromising well over a million users. Another popular example is the NotPetya ransomware attack that was also distributed via an updating server owned by a company that uh, um, manages a, a text management uh, software, very popular text management software, and the ransomware encrypted a bunch of hard drives, causing damage of up to, uh, I think, 10 billion uh, US dollars. So from that we can see um, there is quite a high demand to, to stop these kind of um, supply chain attacks. So that's why we're gonna look a bit deeper into them. So here we have an uh, example of a supply chain where we start with our code repository where we can push in a new code of our applications. Uh, this new code will then run through some kind of CI/CD pipeline where we can do various things. For example, we can lint our code, test our code. At some point, we'll, we'll probably want to build um, our application and push it into some type of registry. Uh, and at the end, our application should be deployed to some kind of uh, production environment. And specific for this talk, uh, since it's called Integrity of Docker Images, we're going to um, focus on applications that are built upon Docker images and Docker containers. But generally speaking, this can also work for, for, for general, um, general applications. So what kind of attacks are we actually focusing on today? Well, we're focusing on attacks uh, that will introduce malicious images into our production cluster. Uh, this can happen either by an attacker actually accessing our production cluster directly and uh, introducing malicious Docker images there, Bitcoin miner, for example, or indirectly by introducing malicious Docker images into our registry, uh, which then gets pulled into our production cluster uh, eventually. So how can we prevent these uh, kind of attacks? Well, the, the, the usual solution on uh, these type of attacks would be to use signatures. It's very similar to how uh, apt, for example, is using it. If you get updates via apt, um, all these um, files are also signed. So we're not doing anything new here. We're just using the, or we would like to use the standard um, solution there. So um, goal is to have um, our source code um, or keep the integrity of our source code uh, throughout the whole pipeline when it reaches the production system and inside the production system. Ideally, we would like to uh, only have code that actually comes from the code repository. So summarized, our two main objectives here are that during building our application, we would like uh, to have the application signed, since we are talking about, uh, since we are in the context of Docker, uh, we would like to sign on Docker images, and when actually pulling in these Docker images into a production environment, we would like to verify the signatures um, that are on these images. For everyone who is uh, already a bit confused by what Docker containers and Docker images actually are, here a quick. Um, Reminder, um, containers are basically these full featured units of software that run in an isolated space on a host machine. They're quite similar to virtual machines with um, the major difference being that virtual machines come with their own kernel, their own operating system, whereas the um, containers usually use the kernel of the underlying host. What are um, container images? Well, container images are Roughly speaking, um, the blueprint for containers. So they are 
like archives that package all the important information for containers in them, meaning the actual source code to run the uh, application that is inside the container, uh, needed environments and any kind of dependencies. Then a container engine, what's that? That's basically just the runtime on which our containers are running on. The most popular solution here would be Docker. And once you reach the point where you want to run uh, a whole lot of containers, and that may be on multiple machines, uh, maybe in the cloud, then you come across something called con container orchestrators. Um, here, the most popular um, solution or the most popular one is uh, Kubernetes and Kubernetes being the production environment in our supply chain e example. Another important thing to know about containers is how do you actually differentiate them? Each container has um, a, a name that identifies it. Uh, as an example, the Nginx uh, container. Uh, additionally to just the name Nginx, there can also be something called a tag. This is this mutable human readable uh, additional descriptor this, that gives some additional um, meaning to it. In our case, uh, for the Nginx container, we can see a uh, some kind of version. Uh, it could also, um, as a tag, have something like the underlying um, underlying uh, system that is being used for the container. For example, uh, Ubuntu or Debian or Alpine. This can also be uh, add as a tag to 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 give it a bit more um, more specific um, description. Um, alternatively, to a tag, you can also use a digest. What's a digest? And a di digest is this immutable, unique uh, SHA-256 hash of the uh, container's content. So from the digest, you can somewhat derive the actual content that is behind uh, this container. Uh, problem with it, uh, or immutable in this case, means that you actually can choose this hash. This is um, uh, fixed for you. Um, and usually we rarely use these uh, as they're kind of bit uh, obscure. It's uh, similar to um, how we are using domain names instead of IP addresses as uh, domain names are just easier to use um, uh, compared to IP addresses, even though IP addresses are the, I guess, in some way more secure way because uh, you don't have things like DNS spoofing. So there's a quite good analogy there. Um, uh, a last fact uh, you should know is that an image always has a digest. There's always this hash over the image content, but not uh, always a tag. So there can also be untagged images. OK, back to our actual objectives that we want to achieve. What do we want to do? When pushing any kind of images, um, It'd be nice if uh, along the way when pushing the image to some kind of registry that uh, somewhere along the way we could create a signature for uh, our given image. Uh, ideally, the signature also should be um, calculated over the digest and not the tag as the digest actually corresponds to the images content as already said. And for the pulling part, um, when we want to pull uh, an image from a registry, uh, we'd expect that the registry uh, somehow re uh, presents us with some kind of signature uh, that we then can verify uh, to make sure that we can actually trust the image we are getting. Uh, a small problem here is that usually we only want to work with these tags, as already said. Uh, you, or in the example of DNS, for example, you usually only want to uh, work with domain names and not IP addresses. It's the same uh, in our, uh, in this case, for Docker. You usually only want to work with tags um, and not digests. But uh, the signature should always be calculated over the digest, as the di only the digest represents the actual image's content. So um, what can we, uh, another problem that uh, poses here is if you want to work with the tag and pull in an image, uh, somehow you have to figure out how does the tag translate to this digest so we can get the right signature for the right image. And what we can do here is instead of just 
signing the digest, we can actually take a mapping of a tag to a digest and then create a signature of this. And uh, so that's how we can solve this kind of minor problem. Uh, another minor problem that's or rather more major problem is that we can't actually store these signatures within the images or um, accompany the images with the signatures uh, and store this in the registry because they're these container images are all standardized by the Open Container Initiative, the OCI, and they have this image speci specification and inside the specification of container images, there actually is no, um, no, um, no place there. So um, if we want to store the signature somewhere, uh, it has to be some, 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 other, um, some other place that is not the registry or inside somewhere in the image. So um, where could that actually be? So where could we uh, store the signature? Luckily, there is something called Notary. Notary is a Cloud Native Computing Foundation project, a CNCF project. And what Notary is, it's basically working as an external server in where we can store signature information. And uh, Notary is actually an implementation of the update framework where Whereas the update framework is this general framework for securing software uh, for securing software update systems. So basically, the the exact thing we are looking for right now. And the update framework is also a CNCF project. And when it was um, developed, uh, there were several design goals that the developers wanted to fulfill. And among these design goals, there were um, goals like that it should be easy to integrate that there should be some kind of key compromise resilience and that the signatures that are created have a freshness guarantee. So right now let's um, look a bit more into how Notary and the update framework achieves these and how we actually create uh, our signatures for, for our um, pushing and pulling scheme. So we we'll start with something called the targets metadata file. The targets metadata file internally is a JSON object or a JSON file. That's why I usually uh, refer to it as to the uh, as the targets JSON. And in this targets JSON, we actually define the content that we want to sign. So in our case, what do we want to sign? We want to sign uh, the image tag to image digest mapping. So we put that into the targets JSON. Uh, additionally, this targets JSON has its own private key. And then we are generating a signature with this private key over this JSON file. And with that, we are already done and have the, the core functionality that we actually want, the signatures, and um, theoretically could stop here. But there are uh, several more things that we could do. So, for example, what happens if our key actually gets compromised and someone uh, gets a hold of uh, our key? Uh, what an attacker could do with it is create a bunch of valid signatures and completely um, and therefore create valid signatures for, for uh, malicious artifacts and therefore completely compromise our whole system. So that's, that's a no-go and we want to prevent that. And how are we going to do that? Well, by introducing a bunch more metadata files and a bunch more keys and putting them into some kind of hierarchy. We start with the, uh, the root JSON file, which is on top uh, of this hierarchy we are building up. Uh, the root JSON metadata file is um, uh, serving two major functionalities. Um, first of all, it offers us the option to easily rotate all the keys of um, the the, lay, the layer below it. So uh, in our case, currently just the targets JSON metadata file, uh, since uh, the public key of the targets JSON metadata file is within the root JSON. So this allows us to easily, should our targets key be compromised, to easily rotate this, this in and out um, by changing this public key here. Uh, the other functionality is actually um, Distribu distributing uh, the, the public keys that are being used for 
actually validating these signatures. Um, as you can see, the public key for the root file is within the root JSON itself, which means we actually have a trust on first use. Um, short is tofu, uh, trust on first use um, principle uh, here in the works, meaning this root JSON metadata file could be compromised from the get-go and the first time we get it, um, we could already be screwed. So the first time you pull in this type of file, you just have to put in some faith um, that it actually isn't compromised or faked from the get-go. That's just how the system is built up. That's a uh, effect we have to just uh, accept. Um, then let's go one uh, hierarchy level lower. Uh, the targets, uh, Jason, we already talked about, but something uh, has changed. Uh, we now have public keys of the layer below the targets, um, Jason metadata file. It now basically serves the the, the same purpose as the root, um, a similar purpose as the root Jason, and uh, that we can uh, easily rotate in and out all the keys of the lower level. So that's what the target Jason now is doing, and. On the lowest, uh, right now, lowest level are um, new files, the delegation files, and they now serve the purpose that the targets JSON previously needed. So here we actually keep the, the actual content that we are trying to sign. Each of these files have their own private key. And the whole purpose of this um, hierarchy setup is that let's say one of our lower keys gets compromised, let's say delegation key one, then an attacker can only um, control everything that is within this file, so all can, can create valid signatures for all artifacts that are actually uh, were signed by this um, delegation key, but not uh, artifacts that were signed by the other key. So for the lower level keys, uh, it holds true that uh, just because you lose one key, uh, not the whole system is compromised. That's obviously not true the, the higher you go in the hierarchy, meaning if you lose the targets key and that gets compromised, everything below it also is compromised, meaning delegation one and delegation two. And uh, the worst case scenario obviously is that our root key gets um, stolen, then we lose basically everything. But uh, if that's why this root key should be secured the most. Uh, if you are thinking in a kind of IT department structure, uh, you could imagine that this root key belongs to some kind of admin that controls the whole system. Um, the targets key could be held by some project manager, um, which allows him to onboard, offboard um, a bunch of new staff members, developers, and the delegation, delegation keys are actually held by the um, individual developers um, who then can use these key to actually create the the, the signatures. Now, what else could happen um, with this scheme? Uh, what an attacker could do, since we're in a supply chain um, scenario where we are constantly updating our um, application, we are constantly creating new signatures for uh, more and more uh, versions of our app. And uh, at some point, our application um, might get completely or some 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 versions of our application might get completely outdated but we still created signatures for them and so an attacker could actually take this um, outdated application take the signature that was um, created for the application at that point and uh, provide it to our system and our system would just accept it as our uh, as our signatures never actually expire. So you could introduce a completely outdated version of the app to our system, uh, a version of our app that is uh, quite likely completely vulnerable and filled with uh, security leaks. So ideally we would have, uh, we would like to have a system that can also um, realize um, that we are getting outdated uh, content. And that is why we introduce the snapshot metadata file, the snapshot JSON. Um, it basically does what the name suggests. It gives you a snapshot of your whole system. It has the hash values of all the other files. So that way you kind of 
get uh, the the most up to date um, status of your of all your current metadata files, and therefore can see if someone is trying to give you something um, something different than the most up to date version. Well, now you could argue, well, someone could also give you an outdated version of the snapshot file. That is true. Um, and that's why there's also the introduction of a version tag that increases every time one of these files is being um, modified. And from this version tag, you can see when someone is trying to give you an older version of this snapshot file, uh, as long as you actually have a local copy of it as a, as a, as a reference point. And uh, from there, you can see if someone gives you a snapshot file with a lower version tag than the one you are having, then you know, OK, he's trying to give me completely outdated uh, metadata information and I, can, and I can reject it, even though the signature might be valid. So that's how we can prevent against uh, these so-called rollback attacks. And now there's yet another attack that can be done. So instead of actually giving us outdated um, artifacts, someone can give us the always same um, seemingly most up-to-date um, metadata. So uh, a, a version of these uh, metadata files that, ha that has the same version tag uh, as we are currently seeing and um, locks us out uh, of any newer versions um, as he's giving us the, the always the same files. So essentially, yeah, freezing freezing us in place and not allowing us to update. And what can we do against that? We introduce the timestamp JSON file. Uh, the timestamp JSON basically is a snapshot of the snapshot and uh, also introduces yet another field, an expiry date for these um, metadata files. If the expiry date expires, then you can just um, deny these metadata files even though they have valid signatures and the special thing about the timestamp uh, file is that it has a quite low expiry date uh, in the notary case this is expiry date is set to uh, around about two days so every two days this metadata file needs to be resigned otherwise it will be rejected uh, meaning that an attacker that doesn't have these uh, the, the the timestamp key can only freeze you in place for about two days. Uh, nothing after that, since he can't create uh, a new timestamp file that um, that is valid uh, with with a, a non-expired expiry date. So that way we can completely mitigate freeze protections. Um, since this. Expiry date is fairly um, small, as it should be. Um, this file needs to be uh, resigned uh, quite often. And since you don't want to do this manually every time, like every two days, uh, you don't want anyone in your company to have uh, to, to to need to um, resign this file every two days. That's why the actual private key for the timestamp file is kept inside Notary. Uh, so notary itself can resign uh, this file uh, every two days uh, or every time something changes in the whole system and the same holds true for the snapshot file so this is just a convenience um, this means these uh, the, the snapshot key and the timestamp key are more likely to be stolen as they are kept online in the server uh, uh, in comparison to uh, the, the the other ones who are kept uh, offline, but um, they are actually not um, they are not actually not uh, signing any malicious content. So you you can't uh, just by having the snapshot key and timestamp key not introduce any any uh, malicious content because this is done by the 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 other files. What you could do is actually mitigate or roll back and freeze protection but not introduce um, bad content. And this is the whole overview of how the update framework um, works and how Notary actually implements uh, this update framework. So let's integrate this into our um, main objective uh, diagram. So when we want to push Docker images 
to our registry, what we are doing is we create a signature over this mapping and push this um, updated metadata files um, into our notary instance where uh, an update of the necessary files uh, will happen and some internal resigning with the snapshot and timestamp file. And uh, for the registry, we just push in the uh, right image just as usual. Um, yeah. And for pulling, uh, when we want to pull an image, we first um, request uh, the signature information from our notary instance, ask for uh, any signature data it has for a given tag. Then we validate all the signatures, uh, all the metadata files, the signatures of the metadata files we got, and then look up um, what tag we are looking for, extract the digest um, that is behind this image tag, and then actually pull just the image given its digest from the registry, and at the end have a Docker image that we hopefully can trust as long as we trust these signatures. And this whole scheme is called Docker Content Trust. This is the uh, signature scheme that was developed by Docker. And um, you can activate this whole stuff by just setting the Docker Content Trust uh, environment variable to, to one. And then after every Docker push and pull operation, you will actually go through this, um, or the, that's what Docker is doing in the background. He will do all these uh, steps I just uh, explained. Um, additionally, um, Docker Content Trust uh, extends the Docker client via some trust subcommands um, that help you to um, to manage uh, all bunch of keys and signatures. So what you can do is generate keys, um, rotate keys, um, sign images locally, and uh, inspect some some um, some Docker images. And uh, as it would seem, uh, we've uh, actually achieved the two objective, uh, objectives we wanted to solve um, and could be done with it. But unfortunately, there's yet another problem. That being that Kubernetes, so our production environment, doesn't actually support Docker Content Trust meaning the second objective where we want to pull in Docker images into our Kubernetes cluster, into our production environment. Um, this part can't do the image verification as Docker Content Trust isn't supported. So that kind of sucks, but there are ways around it, um, luckily. There's something called, um, something called Kubernetes admission controllers. These are small little service, services you can integrate into Kubernetes. And these allow you to intercept any kind of requests that are being sent um, to your Kubernetes cluster and then apply some kind of user defined controls on them. Uh, on them. They usually come in two uh, different kinds, either validating admission controllers or mutating admission controllers mean you can do some validation on the request you are getting uh, in some way and also uh, mutate this request um, uh, changing it a uh, little bit and then sending it uh, forth uh, to the actual Kubernetes uh, data store. And what we can do is actually take one of these admission controllers and add the whole image uh, signature verification we just explained and put it in there. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, and the, the result of this is called Connoisseur, uh, our own uh, implementation of exactly that. So what we did uh, is we integrated signature verification into Kubernetes and what we also did um, in comparison to how Notary and Docker Content Trust usually uh, does it, we added trust pinning. So instead of actually using the root public key that is, um, that is defined in the root JSON and the, the reason uh, why this whole system is using trust on first use, we actually ignore this key and trust pin a specific root public key uh, right beforehand and integrate it into Connoisseur. Whenever we are getting some kind of trust data, we use this root public key to verify the 
root JSON. And if we can trust this root JSON, we automatically, since there are all the other public keys in there, automatically get the trust of all the other public keys and verify all the other files. And here, like a small um, scheme on what we are essentially doing. We are taking any kind of requests that are sent to Kubernetes. We look at this request and extract uh, any image references uh, in there um, and then send a request to a notary instance uh, asking for signature information regarding to this image. Uh, and also use the trust pinned uh, root public key to validate these uh, signature informations. Um, if there are no trust data available for this image uh, in the first place, as there never was a signature for this, then we straight up deny the request, um, not allowing to deploy these images to our Kubernetes cluster, or should the signatures, the metadata files, um, not have valid um, signatures, then we also deny this, uh, this request right from the get-go. Uh, if everything uh, for now checks out, we have an internal policy that we can apply to the um, trust data, to the, to the metadata we got, uh, and do uh, some, 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 some additional controls there. So for example, you can um, uh, say that a certain signer needs to be uh, inside this uh, signature information. Otherwise, uh, you can say, I want to deny the request because I only trust a certain um, signer. Uh, that's uh, one of the things you could do here in this policy. And yeah, if it doesn't comply, we deny it. If it does comply, we extract the actual digest that is given in these metadata files and in, in, in our signature basically, and mutate the request in a way that it's uh, not using the image plus tag combination anymore, but actually the image plus digest combination. So, and now starts the funny part, the demo. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, we're currently in the um, Connoisseur repository and what we're gonna do is, nope, nope, set up. Um, we're gonna create two images. Uh, one will be signed, the other one won't be signed. So this is um, like an example uh, Docker image that we're going to build. So Docker build, and let's create the unsigned first. There we built our image. Then what we're going to do is uh, actually um, modify our um, file a little bit so we get different digests. So let me add another O there. Okay, so we changed the Docker file. Now we're gonna build again and actually tag this as signed. Build that again. And now we're gonna um, push these two images I just built into some registry. Uh, so Docker image push. First, we're gonna push the unsigned one. without creating a signature. And then we're gonna do something a little bit different and actually sign a Docker image. Uh, we can do that uh, as already said by setting the um, Docker content trust environment vari variable to one. Um, usually you also have to, um, to, to uh, assign a notary server via the docker content trust underscore server environment variable but if you are using the default notary server um, that is given by docker hop you don't actually have to define this so what we're going to do is we set docker content trust to one and then actually just as we would usually do uh, push our image and docker a image, push, php let's image, and then use the signed one. And what will happen is now um, it will actually create uh, the signature for us. A uh, problem here is we currently do not have a root key and a targets key that will be used to create these signatures. So create 
the signatures for these metadata files. So what um, Docker will do here or Docker Content Trust will do here is generate these files for us and actually ask us for doing some uh, for entering passphrases for these um, for these key for these private keys. So first a passphrase for the uh, root key. So I'm going to choose a passphrase here and then repository key here refers to the target key from before. So yet another um, uh, passphrase there and bada bing bada boom successfully signed uh, our docker image. Now what I forgot to do, which I knew I would forget, uh, is actually starting up my mini cube so we can test uh, this in an actual um, Kubernetes cluster. So bear with me uh, a little bit uh, until my cluster uh, did start up. Um, but I can uh, explain what we're going to do now. So we will be installing Connoisseur and what we have to do beforehand is actually get the root public key. And um, for that, unfortunately, what Docker Content Trust doesn't do is just give us the public key. It just stores the private key on your machine and you have to um, generate the public part uh, from this one yourself. Um, and that's what we're going to do in just a second. Then integrate this public key into our Connoisseur configuration. So basically trust pinning this root public key into Connoisseur. Then install Connoisseur and then see if we did everything right. Okay, so um, there we have to go into the uh, into this directory uh, dot docker trust private. There we have our two private keys, which are encrypted, and I prepared a little script that helps me to generate the root public key from uh, one of these files, which refers to the root key. We have to uh, enter the passphrase we just set, and with that we have our root public key, which you can actually cat root dot pub. There we have our root public key. Then I'm going to take this, going to copy this, then, oh, sorry, I'm going to make this really big so you can see. This is the, um, uh, the, 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 the connoisseur configuration and in here we can put the root public key. That's what I'm going to do. Control V, then do some alignment, store this. And now what's left to do, uh, let's go back. Uh, what's left to do uh, if our Kubernetes cluster is running, let me quickly check, get NS. Yeah, our cluster is there. And then we can install Connoisseur by just doing make install. And if I did everything right, we have to wait a few seconds until Connoisseur is installed. This may take uh, up to, depending on your download um, speed, this can take quite some time. And there it is. I can do a get all. These are all the uh, connoisseur pods that are running. And now let's uh, create a sample namespace in which we want to create um, new containers basically uh, switch to it yeah and what i'm now going to do i'm going to run a pod and inside this pod i'm going to define some docker image and first i'm going to uh, define the unsigned image that we uh, just pushed it was called unsigned uh, image unsigned and theoretically what should happen now is that connoisseur intercepts this, gets the um, signature information from notary, and then tells you could not find signed digest for image docker IO um, PHB lids image unsigned interest data, meaning there is no signature for this specific image uh, in the notary instance and therefore 
this whole stuff gets um, denied. If we do cube get all, nothing is in the current namespace, even though we just tried to uh, run a pod. We do the same thing, but with the signed version. And let's hope that I did everything right. The pod get actually, gets actually created. If we do get all, there we have our pod. And everything works as it should. So, as a summary, yeah, Connoisseur is this admission controller we wrote for uh, Kubernetes. It does signature verification as we uh, just saw, and we do some trust pinning. The whole project is open source, so you can uh, go to our GitHub page and um, actually look at the code, uh, get familiar with it, maybe do some contribution. Uh, feel, free, feel free to do this. When we um, designed the whole project, we tried to make everything as as simple as we could, as we uh, realized that this whole system behind it, so the, the the update framework is quite complex. So we tried to 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 hide this uh, and make it uh, as simple as we can, uh, and also uh, increase uh, the compatibility. Uh, so making Connoisseur available for all major Kubernetes um, providers, uh, including Sys11's MetaCube. Um, and we also think that these two points, simplicity and compatibility, are especially important for, for any kind of um, security projects you're doing um, as this increases security uh, as a whole. Um, there are some features, um, uh, some, some additional features in Connoisseur. Um, among uh, these, there's, for example, allow listing, so you can um, allow certain images uh, that should not be um, uh, verified, that don't need uh, signatures, because there are often problems that uh, you don't have the control over all images running in your cluster. So you can't always create signatures for each and every image, uh, so you can carefully um, select an allow list for that. Uh, we also realized that there are some alternatives, so some other projects that are trying to do the same thing we did. Uh, there's, for example, the Open Policy Agent, which is not completely focused on uh, doing image uh, signature verification, but general um, uh, application of policies. Um, so you could use this as well. And there's also Portieris. Um, by Portieris by IBM, um, who are doing basically the same as we do, with uh, the difference being that they actually only currently on, only work for the IBM cloud and none of the other major uh, Kubernetes providers. So that's uh, also one of the reasons why we sat down and created our own solution. As an outlook, uh, Notary is actually uh, right now being reworked. So there's Notary version 2 coming. Um, the, the people who created Notary realized that storing all these signatures in an external server isn't maybe not that good of an idea and uh, probably it's best to actually store the uh, signatures inside the images or inside the image registry and thus they actually have to sit down and completely change the OCI uh, image specification. And all the major registry providers, meaning um, Amazon, Microsoft, and whatnot, uh, all have to work together. So they actually uh, implement the the, the right uh, image specifications, so everything uh, can work with signatures. And other than that, feel free to check out our GitHub repository, where you can uh, clone a connoisseur uh, yourself and play around with it. And if you're even more interested, uh, you can read our blog post uh, about Connoisseur and how Connoisseur works. And with that, I want to say thank you for your attention and cheers.